Good morning. If you would take your Bibles and open them up with me to the book of Exodus, we're in Exodus 29. As we finished yesterday's study in chapter 28, we finished with these three words about Aaron and his sons. They were to be anointed, they were to be ordained, and they were to be consecrated. Now, what we're going to see in our present chapter is what this consecration looked like. Now let's review again those three terms because there's so much overlap in these terms that, that it gets kind of confusing. But when we look at them all together, we, we should see a, a, a clearer picture. Anointing was oil that they would anoint on someone or on a uh, specific item. And it was a symbol of God's presence. Of course, God is the Spirit, and you could not see Him. So the oil is the oil of the presence. So if I was uh, anointing someone with oil, I was showing that the Holy Spirit is on them. God's Spirit rests on this person. Or God's Spirit is going to work through this tabernacle or this altar. And remember, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come on someone and then leave them. Um, much like we see later on in the life of the first king of Israel, King Saul, is that God's Spirit came on him and empowered him, but then through his disobedience, God's Spirit left. The great, even David, when he was uh, in sin uh, and, and repenting and getting right with God, he was, don't let your spirit leave me. Okay, uh, Under the new covenant, the awesome uh, gift that's given us that the Spirit doesn't leave. Um, the Spirit dwells, and as children of God, there's no, uh, go read uh, John chapter 10 about that. So in this, the anointing has to do with the presence of God and a symbol of that. The next is ordaining. And we, we know a little bit about ordaining when someone uh, is called to be a pastor and a church will ordain them. Or if someone is uh, recognized as a deacon in the office of the church, and so we will ordain them. This is another uh, term. It, it means to fill or to fully equip. Um, they're ready. God's given them what they need. And then we have this word consecrate, which we're going to see over and over, which is just another word for what was on Aaron's head, holy to the Lord. Uh, consecrate means to set apart, to sanctify. And this next chapter, we're going to read about God laying out what it's going to take for a priest, a high priest, to be set apart for him. So, this, this ceremony was only done at the beginning of his ministry. Aaron's starting, so this, this uh, ceremony will not be done again until Aaron dies and his son takes over for him. So we see God laying it out in, in chapter 29. In Leviticus chapter 8, we're going to see it actually carried out. So we're going to talk a lot about the sacrifices and the consecration ritual here. However, more uh, understanding will come when we get to Leviticus. And so if, if you have a lot of questions and you say, well, we're not going through this deep enough. I, I have a lot of questions, especially about these things. These always confuse me. There are seven feasts. And there are five sacrifices. Seven feasts, five sacrifices. That always gets confusing to me. Uh, we'll go through all that when we get into Leviticus and Numbers. Uh, the five sacrifices we'll talk about in our present chapter. There's the burnt offering. There's a meal offering. There's a peace offering. These three are all done to maintain a relationship with God. So the burnt offering, the meal offering, and the peace offering 
are maintenance offerings um, for the most part. Uh, then there's two others. There's the, the sin offering and the trespass offering, which are to restore a relationship with God. So um, think through those. If, if you say, how do, we, how do we get all this in our head? I want to show you something. This is a, it's a big book. It's not a book to read. It's a reference book. It's called Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. When you're first starting out studying the Bible, it sometimes can become overwhelming. So you're going to need a few things. We've talked about this before. You're going to need a concordance, what's called an exhaustive concordance. So an exhaustive concordance will, I can look at a word in my present verse, and I can go to my concordance, Strong's concordance is the best one. In the exhaustive concordance, I can look at this word, and it'll tell me every other verse in the Bible where this word is used. And this starts to help us get a grasp on uh, the context and that the Bible is best at explaining itself. This, it, this book is really good because it gives you a lot of charts and, and things like that. That I'm a, I'm a visual learner, so this will help you a lot in understanding what are the five sacrifices, what are the seven feasts, what are, what's the division in God's law, because there's, there's moral law, there's the spiritual code, and then there's the social code. How does that all split up? And, and we're going to see uh, there's a lot to learn in this. Of course, the moral law is the Ten Commandments. The spiritual code is what we're talking about here. The feasts and the sacrifices. And then we have the social code, which is what God wanted to, them to do in order to regulate this nation until Christ comes on the scene. So the social law has been done away with. The feasts and the sacrifices are fulfilled in Christ. The moral law still stands. All of those are, are repeated in the New Testament except for Sabbath and Sabbath the whole book of Hebrews is written to explain that in Christ is where we find rest no longer in a day of the week but in Christ but the fulfillment of all of the law is in Christ because it's our tutor remember Galatians says to push us and to understand our need of a savior so all that's being said if you haven't read chapter 29 read it and uh and we'll dive into it together. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. And Father, we thank you for people who have uh, done lifetime worth of work uh, to help us, to give us tools. Not to give us shortcuts, but so that we could better understand and better uh, know you. Thank you, Father, for all of the historical background stuff that we have. May we utilize it so that your word can become real to us. So, Father, as we look into consecration today, Father, may we get a real sense of how holy you are. And a real sense of the privilege of communing and abiding with you. And a real sense of what justification, sanctification really mean in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 1. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them to minister as priests to me. Um, interesting that this is not something that Aaron could do for himself. This is something that has to be done to him. Um, and when you think of every Christian, every born-again person being a priest in this holy priesthood unto God, you start to realize that none of us can initiate this. God has to initiate this. Uh, but in it, I'm a willing participant. Now, once he's given me life, now there are some things that I'm going to work with him on, and we're going to talk all about that. But notice that these are things done to Aaron. Uh, 
Consecration is going to require some things. Uh, and I remember them by B words. It's going to take blood and it's going to take bread. And I think that's a, um, an interesting connection. The blood is to take care of the guilt of sin. The bread is because it's going to be fellowship with God. That's the whole purpose of this. Uh, many times, even in the New Testament, uh, in the church today when we're talking about salvation, we're, we're thinking about salvation from hell. But So we're thinking of salvation from, not salvation to. And both are involved. It's salvation from sin, but it's salvation to having a daily fellowship with God, an abiding walk with Him. Both are involved here in this picture with the priest. Blood and bread. It says... Take one young bull and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, unleavened wafers spread with oil. You shall make them a fine wheat flour. Now, here's the interesting thing. The only thing they're getting out in the wilderness is manna. So here in this, this had to be stuff that they brought with them from Egypt. So this would have been precious stuff um, at the particular time. But remember, they're only a few months out. It will get more difficult as their rebellion causes them to be in the wilderness for 40 years. It says in verse 3, you shall put them in one basket. Think how specific God is. I want you to take these. This is the type of bread I want. I want you to put it all in one basket. And present them in the basket along with the bull and the two rams. Okay, so that's, that's the material list, what you're going to need. Now, let's go through the steps of how this is to be carried out. First, then you shall bring Aaron. We've got all the stuff we need. I've got the, the cow. I've got two rams. And I've got all the bread in one basket, so I'm ready. Now, bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meetings. So, remember, there, there's the, the tabernacle, the tent that, that it houses the holy place and the holy of holies but that's inside this fence of curtains called the meeting place and so there's one gate there and that's where this is done in front of the whole congregation and in leviticus 8 it says that moses called the whole congregation together so you've you've got this massive a million plus people watching this aaron and his sons at the doorway of this tabernacle. And what's happening? It says, wash them with water. Public bath. Notice that they don't wash themselves. Others wash them. This is the idea that I can't take care of me. I need something else. I need someone to come along and save me. I can't do it. And all of these pictures are being given to us. It's interesting that this washing only happened one time. One time they had this full bottle body washing. And then after this, the, the priest's job was bloody. But there was this laver that we'll learn about later that they would wash their hands with. This is a lot of what's going on when Jesus is talking with his disciples at the Last Supper. And Jesus, they're arguing, the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest, and, and Jesus tells them that the greatest is going to be the servant. And then Jesus starts to wash their feet. He gets all the way around to Peter, who is sitting in the servant seat. Peter should have been the one washing feet. But he was thinking he was too good for that. And so he comes, Jesus comes to wash Peter's feet. And Peter said, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus tells him, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And then Peter says something interesting. He says, then don't just wash my feet. Wash my whole body. But then Jesus relates to him that he's already been washed. Now all he needs to do is this fellowship with God, maintaining fellowship with God, washing the feet. And there's spiritual imagery through all of that 
uh, pointing back here. Uh, so they're in the doorway. They're being washed in front of everybody. And when they get done being washed, then they take the garments that we read about yesterday, the tunic, the robes, the ephod, the breastpiece, the turban, the holy plaque that says holy to the Lord. Verse 7 says, then you shall take the anointing oil. So they're clothed now. Now you're anointing them with oil. Um, there's this beautiful picture of being clothed here. The put on and put off. And I won't make a lot of hay of this, but in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, uh, and even in Revelation 3, it's talked about being clothed. Uh, but I love, I think Colossians 3 uh, is the best place to go look at this, where it talks about putting off the old man and putting on the new man. And I, I love, when you, when you get into the nuances of the language, the put off the old man is an active verb, putting it off. Uh, I have to do it. Aaron took off his old robes. But then someone else clothed him. And the idea in the New Testament is that this new man is what the Holy Spirit comes in and starts to produce. So we've talked often about this work of faith, this process called CCR, conviction, confession, and repentance. Is that That's the putting off or putting to death the old man. And so I'm going through the process. I'm in the Word. The Holy Spirit is on me, convicting me of sin, things that don't line up with being in Christ. And so I'm agreeing with the Holy Spirit. I'm not grieving Him. I'm, I'm agreeing with Him, and I am confessing my sin. I'm turning from it in repentance, and I'm walking forward in humility. And as this process goes on, the Holy Spirit starts to clothe us with the new man. This new man that has the capability to love other people the way that naturally I love myself. Giving me love for other people. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, self-control. All of the things that are fruit of the Spirit. And you see all these elements here that will give us much more understanding when we read under the new covenant. So they... Verse 7, then you shall take the anointing oil, pour it on his head and anoint him. And shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. You shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and bind caps on them. And they shall have the priesthood by perpetual statute. Meaning it's their birthright. It's not something they've earned. It's not something that they have ambition for. It says, so you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. You shall equip them, fill them. They've got everything that they need. They're set apart for service to me. Now he's going to go through the sacrifices. And we're not going to get a full understanding here of the sacrifices. We'll get more in the next book, in Leviticus um, and in Numbers. And we'll, we'll understand more of what this goes on. But it's so important. To understand the five sacrifices in the Old Testament. Because when we read verses like Romans 12, 1, where it says, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices. Trying to understand what that means. What is God trying to tell us? What does that look like? And we're, go we're going to see what that looks like here initially and we'll get more as we study and like we've said before Leviticus tends to be one of those books that if you're reading through the Bible if you're just kind of just skimming reading it uh, you're gonna lose sight real quick but if you really start to understand the feasts and the sacrifices and how all of these things point to Jesus um, in my own imagination I'm thinking of the two men that were on the road to Emmaus after Jesus' death and resurrection, and he meets up with them, and they don't recognize him. And Jesus sits down with them, and he starts to explain how all of this points to him. Man, wouldn't you love to have that commentary going on? Um, 
So verse 10 uh, is going to, 10 through 14 is going to explain the sin offering. And we see that right at the end of verse 14. It is a sin offering. Then from verses 15 to 18, we see at the end of verse 18, it is a burnt offering to the Lord. So we've got sin offering and burnt offering. Then we go uh, from 19 to 21, we're going to talk about a consecration offering. So one is the bull, one is one ram, one is the other ram. Just kind of get that in your head. Remember, this is only done, this is a consecration ceremony, only done when a high priest is being uh, brought in. And it would only happen, like Aaron is going to be the high priest, it won't happen again until Aaron dies and one of his sons takes over for him. Then they will go through this seven-day consecration again. It says, you shall take the bull right out in front of the tent of meetings, in front of everybody. And Aaron and his son, <clears throat> excuse me, Aaron and his son shall lay uh, hands on the head of the bull and then slaughter the bull before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meetings. So the emphasis is that it is before the Lord, but not only is it before the Lord, it's in front of the whole congregation also. So think about it. The cow is there. They're all putting their hands on the cow. Why? This is the idea of substitution that they are transferring their own guilt uh, onto this cow. And really, it's, it's this. The difference between the sin offering and the burnt offering is this. The sin offering is, I haven't given my best to the Lord. I haven't given my best to the Lord. Uh, I'm aware of that, and I'm placing that guilt on this bull. The, the burnt offering is, I haven't given all to the Lord. So there's a nuance here between giving my best and giving my all. So God wants both. And he gets into this, he says, you're laying your hands on the bull. Now, when people would bring their sacrifices, a lamb or whatever, they would lay their hands on the showing the substitutionary work that's being done. They would confess particular sins at this time with their hands on uh, the sacrificial lamb or sacrificial animal. If it were a um, restoring sacrifice, so if it was a trespass or a, um, a sin offering versus the maintain. Uh, offering. So we'll go through more of that when we get into Leviticus. Then it says this, um, verse 12, you shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger. You shall pour out all the blood at the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails and the lobes of the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and offer them up in smoke on the altar, so burn it all up. But the flesh of the bull and the hide and its refuge you shall take and burn outside the camp. It is the sin offering, and that's the idea of taking our sin away. We'll talk more about that when we're talking about the sacrifices for all the people, which is called a scapegoat, and we'll talk about that later. So that's the sin offering. We get to the burnt offering. You shall take one of the rams and lay Aaron and his sons, lay their hands on the ram. <clears throat> Slaughter the ram. Take the blood and sprinkle it around the altar. And then cut the ram into pieces and wash it. Put all the pieces with the head on the altar and you shall offer up smoke the whole ram of the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a soothing aroma, an offering by fire to the Lord. Remember, the first one is a restoring offering. This is a maintaining offering. Um, but this idea of complete devotion, anytime we see something being totally burned up, is this idea of all in. Um, so when we go from there, what about, so we've got the, the, 
the cow gone and one of the rams gone, what about the other ram? This is the ram of consecration. It says, then she'll take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. You shall slaughter the ram, take some of the blood, and put it on the right lobe of Aaron's ear, and on the thumbs of his right hands, and big toe. So you've got ear, hand, or thumb, and toe. What's the idea here? It's this idea of identifying with the sacrificial victim. Okay, the, I'm in this. this. This is because of me. In Leviticus 17, 11, it talks about that the life is in the blood. And this is the idea of top, middle, bottom, I'm covered with the blood of this ram. And he goes on in here and he says this. Um, Sprinkle the rest of the blood around the altar. Then take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and mix it together. This is the like double anointing. So you've got the blood and the spirit together, which is, man, perfect understanding of justification, the blood. Sanctification, the spirit how they're working together. And God's trying to give us a picture of it, even here. It says, sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments and on his sons and on his son's garments. So he and his garments shall be, what? Consecrated, as well as his sons and his son's garments with him. So this idea of, remember, consecration is set apart, sanctified for the glory of the Lord. And so... It's Now we go from there into verse 22, where it's going to, it says, takes also some of the fat from the ram uh, the, and uh, the kidneys and it from the ram of ordination and one cake of bread and one cake of the bread mixed with oil, one wafer of the unleavened bread, which is set before the Lord. And you shall put all of these in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons. And they shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. That just means doing this, offering it up to the Lord. This is what is called the peace offering. Sometimes in our text it's called a heave offering. It's just lifting it up. Then what are they to do with it? After that, you shall take them from their hands and offer them up in smoke on the altar of the burnt offering for a soothing aroma before the Lord. Remember, peace offering is much like the burnt offering. Uh, it's a maintained offering. It's not something to get something right. It's to keep things going. Uh, the meal offering, too, we'll read later about grain offerings and that kind of thing. Um, verse 26, then you shall take the breast of Aaron's ram of ordination and wave it as a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. Um, you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering, which was waved and was offered from the ram of ordination, from the one which was for Aaron and for, from the one which was for his sons. It shall be for Aaron and his sons as their portion forever from the sons of Israel. For it is a heave offering, and it shall be a heave offering from the sons of Israel for the sacrifice of their peace offering, even the heave offering to the Lord. Basically, they're in this consecration ceremony for seven days. And in seven days, they've got to eat. They're, in, they're not leaving the tent of meetings for seven days. And this is what they're going to eat. They're going to eat the breast portion and the thigh portion. Here's what I feel like is the interesting part of this. Eating is part of this ceremony. This So this the sacrifice is not only put on the blood, is not only put on their ear and their thumb and their toe. Then it's also consumed in them. It's part of them. And it's interesting that the Eating never is a picture of giving life. Eating never gives life because in order to eat, you have to already have life. 
So here, the eating is to, again, maintain the life, not to get life. That would be what the blood was for. The, the sin, remember we said right from the beginning, the blood was to take care of the sin. The bread was to take, to, was to reveal the um, communion and fellowship that God is having uh, with his people. And again, you say, well, I've got a lot of questions about these offerings, and it's not really clear what's the difference between a heave offering and a wave offering and a peace offering. A lot of these things are synonymous, and we'll see that later on when we get to Leviticus. So just hold tight, and uh, we'll learn a bunch as we go through Leviticus together. Verse 29 says, The holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him that in them they may be anointed and ordained. For seven days the one of his sons who is the priest in his stead shall put them on when he enters the tent of meetings to minister in the holy place. So when Aaron dies, I believe it's Eliezer that takes over for him. It, it'll be this another seven-day consecration. Um, there's no carryover in this, but it's a one-time thing. A one-time washing uh, and so many great pictures, so many symbols of what's going to come in the future uh, in Christ. Uh, we're going to continue on food for the priest. It says, you shall take the ram of ordination and boil its flesh in a, in a holy place. Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket at the doorway of the tent of meetings. Thus, they shall eat those things by which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration. But a layman shall not eat them, because they are holy. Uh, in Levit Let's read Leviticus 22. Leviticus 22, 11. Uh, says it this way. Uh, this gives another caveat. So... Nobody can eat of this food that's not a priest. But if I buy, it says, but if I buy a priest buys a slave as his property with his money, that one may eat of it, and those who are born in this house may eat of the food. So remember, uh, the priest provides for his family, and that also includes any slave, which is interesting when we think about 1 Peter 2, in verses 5 and 9 where it says, we're now a holy priesthood. Well, how could we be a holy priesthood? In Christ. He redeemed us. He bought us. We're his slave. But not only are we his slave, he made us his own children. He adopted us. And so we freely get to eat uh, from the portion. So th that's another kind of picture going on here. Uh, verse 34, if any of the flesh of the ordination or any of the bread remains until morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire, and it shall be, not be eaten because it is holy. Leftovers don't reveal the picture that God is trying to show. Uh, verse 35, thus you shall do to Aaron and to his sons according to all that I have commanded you. You shall ordain them through seven days. Each day you shall offer a bull as a sin offering for atonement. So this goes on for seven days, this same process, um, which, which reveals that this is only a temporary covering. You can go to Hebrews 9, uh, 23 through 20. Well, let's go there. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. You can't read this enough. Uh, it says this. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in heaven to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, as the priests entered the holy place uh, year by year with blood that is not their own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, 
at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die, and after that comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. So all of the Old Testament sacrifices were pointing to the one. They're, they're not making atonement. They're showing a picture that people could believe by faith of the atonement that God was going to provide in the future. They're saved by grace through faith in what God will do. We are saved by grace through faith in what God has already done in Christ. So keep that ordered in your mind. Um, look at verse 38. It says, Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two one-year-old lambs each day continuously uh, through the seven days. The one lamb uh, you shall... So wait a minute. Now on the first day, you, you have a bull, two rams. Every day after that, one bull and then lambs. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, the other lamb at twilight. Which is, if you go to Matthew 1... If you remember, Zacharias, uh, John the Baptist's father, is, again, doing the morning sacrifice, uh, which is really cool. Um, it says, the other lamb shall be offered at twilight, and there shall be one-tenth of an ephod of flour, fine flour mixed with one-fourth of a hen of beaten oil and one-fourth of a hen of wine for a drink offering with one lamb. Well, he said, what's the drink offering? This is part of the meal offering we'll talk about later. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight in, in the same way. And it says this, for an aroma, a soothing aroma, an offering by fire to the Lord, it shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the doorway of the tent of meetings before the Lord. Just a side note here. Um, talking about the drink offering. In Philippians 2.17, Paul describes his life and his surrender to the Lord as being a drink offering, and he's described as being poured out. And when it's empty, he will die. Um, just a point. Let's read. It says, God's talking about what he's going to do. Um, it says, the tent of meetings before the Lord where I will meet with you. Well, so this isn't just about appeasing God, appeasing God's anger. That blood part does that. But the bread part, the fellowship part is the point to speak to you there, to meet with you. I will meet there with the sons of Israel through the priests and it will be it should be consecrated by my glory. God's glory is going to dwell in there, which is so sad that when Jesus said it was finished and the, the veil was torn from top to bottom and there, everybody could see inside, the glory, Ichabod, had departed. What did the priests do? They stitched it back up. And for several more decades until Titus in 70 AD comes in and destroys the temple, they just pretended. They pretended that the glory of God was there. Brothers and sisters, man, I don't want to be pretending that the glory of God is on my life when it's not. Let's not pretend about these things. If God's not using me, let's be honest and figure out why. He goes on. I will consecrate the tent of meetings and the altar. I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to minister as priests to me. I will dwell among the sons of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. I am Yahweh their Elohim. Remember, Yahweh is the personal. Elohim is the power. Well, in Leviticus 9, we'll finish with this. In Leviticus 
nine, they're they're dedicating the tabernacle. And in verse 23, it says this. Well, verse 22 says, Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them, and he stepped down after making the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Then the fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offerings and the portions of fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their face. What a big moment. You would think a life-changing moment, but what we're going to find with Israel is all too quickly they went right back to their own way. God kept revealing more of his power to them so that they could grow in faith. But they refused. That's why God referred to them as a stubborn and stiff-necked generation. That's the last thing I want to be. Let's examine our hearts today to see, are we consecrated? Uh, has the blood of Jesus Christ justified us? Now, is his spirit sanctifying us so that we are having fellowship with God? Remember, it's not just about God taking away the guilt of your sin. That's part of it. But he's also saved you to have fellowship with him every day. And I pray that you are. Father, we love you. Thank you for today. Help us to live for you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.